we have to move on now to the next speaker on our panel, who is the amazing Sana Shaik, who is an architect, educator, activist, and she has a burning passion for inclusion in the environment. She um, teaches at Oxford Groups now, and she also has her own practice that is Native Studio. Um, hi, everybody. Really lovely to speak to you this evening. Um, thank you, everyone who's gone before me. I kind of echo a lot of what you've said, um, and I think that some of what I touch upon probably complements it a lot as well. Um, yeah, just to kind of continue um, what was said about me. Um, so I work in large practice. I have my own small practice. Um, I teach at Central St. Martins, the AA um, and Reba Studio, Oxford Brooks um, and Examine as well. So I've kind of been at, at part one, part two and part three. So um, I've kind of been at every level of, of architectural education and practice working on small buildings as well as huge master plans. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of very involved in the discourse between education and practice. So I, my talk kind of uh, like extends to try and look at kind of the reality of the built environment and colonization and how we can kind of look at the theory, but also look at what that means on an urban scale and in reality. Um, and I hope that it kind of can make us think a little bit more about how we see our urban spaces and as designers, how we start to design in that way. The practice of architecture is inherently ridden with multiple acts of colonization. A site is found, a use is attributed and a new group of people settle. Materials and structures, both physical and non-physical, are imposed. Both historically, from the European colonization of Asia, Africa, the Americas and beyond to our present day, as we continue to destroy the earth for future generations and encounter new territories, spatial interventions continue to manifest colonization in multiple ways. So by examining and deconstructing the forms and processes involved in colonization, we can begin to understand its wider impact on individuals and how this extends into our urban spaces. We may then start to ask questions about the urban spaces that might truly challenge the legacy of colonization and its effect on our ambition to create equitable, accessible spaces for all. So firstly, if we look at what does it mean to, to actually colonize, colonization refers to the actions of settling among, exploiting and establishing control over the indigenous population of an area, appropriating space and its resources for one's own use. Within a global and historical context, the legacy of colonial colonization highlights the occupation of Europe over much of the world, as we can see in this map, where you can see how very few areas in the world have not been somehow colonized by Europe or influenced heavily. This has established Europe as a dominant global culture on multiple levels. The, the effects of this on the built environment we'll start to look at a little bit later on. But initially, we're going to look at the direct definitions of what it means to colonize and how this can relate directly to the built environment. So firstly, to settle. So when a type of building or its associated users settle in a place unfamiliar to a locality, imposing a new character for the place, um, this can be seen all over London in the newer, much denser tower blocks proposed in areas of low rise um, areas, so like Brixton, for example, or um, even you know like Brick Lane area. Um, often these tower blocks are devoid of the character that's specific or special to that place. Um, similarly, on Brick Lane, we can look at the new influx of new services and chains that begin to settle among the traditional services that were once customary to that area. To exploit. So turning land, which was previously for leisure and recreation into space for development, attributing a different use to benefit people who are not from the area. This was really extremely evident in the Olympic legacy where it, suggest, it was suggested that the land um, was a wasteland um, and they were making a better use of it um, and it had no existing communities. And so it was a positive use, but that was really not the case. Um, the land was home to a lot of green spaces, allotments, markets, various uses to um, com smaller communities that did once exist. And there was a big loss of biodiversity and the creatures specific to that area. Um, yeah. So also in, within that area, as the area accumulated more development, the buildings were improved, densified, maximized um, to benefit developers, people not from the area again. So to control. So changing, people were able to change the makeup of the area by pushing groups out and installing organizations and companies that those who are not from the locality benefit from. So for example, the tenants of Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre 
um, they have they were moved out and displaced um, by larger organizations um, to make way for a very kind of different demographic of people. Okay. Um, so to appropriate space for one's own use. So in this example in Hackney Wick, you can see how the existing buildings have been appropriated for workspace that can now be sold and rented for financial gain, as we see in the background, the workspace to let, rather than the original workspace that existed and that was affordable and appropriate to the people who were already present there. Um, or another example where a popular cafe was removed in, pla removed in place of homes to financially benefit developers. So if we delve a little bit deeper into these examples, we can start to think about how there are multiple forms of colonization and the effects that this can have on societies and people. Colonization can be broken down into the physical, social, the economic and the political. This diagram begins to explore how these ideas might be related. So we'll now take a look at some examples past and present um, of, the, of these manifestations. So perhaps the form we're most familiar with might be that of the physical, so to build or to shape a space. Um, in historical context, um, this can be manifested, manifested in the form of borders, as you can see here how the pre-colonization map of Africa had areas and regions that overlapped, um, the borders were not defined, they were kind of they're a lot more holistic and organic, um, and, and they weren't like definitive. But Post-colonization, post we can see how the borders were drawn by colonial powers to define these African countries um, as per their own interests, affecting access, representation and movement. And it, it's, it's really interesting because if you study closely, you can see, for example, here how Namibia has this tiny little arm that goes all the way to Zimbabwe, which is about trying to access water so that they can ship resources better to themselves. Um, so it's, it's really visible there. Um, similarly, the imposition, as, as has been mentioned earlier, of physical buildings designed in a style relevant to colonizers and the imposition of infrastructure, which again only serves the colonizers interest, are consistent physical manifestations of colonialism within the spaces in which they occupy. So if we look at this in the urban context of London, we can look at these red line boundaries, which we're all very familiar with for development plots, areas which developers dictate. Um, creating boundaries and divisions through materials and ownership, isolating them from the wider context and colonizing a specific area, which can have numerous effects on the surrounding areas as well. So here you can see um, the Olympic Park um, before it was developed and after it was developed and how previously the boundaries were perhaps less defined, but afterwards you can see there's clearly a very different, there'll be a different approach, different materiality, different form to the, to the new development areas. The presence of physical buildings, including the statue of, of figures who have negative connotations with these causes like race or empire, again, we touched upon this earlier, um, as well as the architectural language of buildings that embody slavery. So for example, these warehouse typologies in Hackney Wick that sit on these old sugar factories, um, which where the warehouses were dedicated to the sugar trade that came from slavery. And these continue to be manifestations of this colonialist legacy. Um, so politically, politically, the governance of the colonizers ensured submission from local people and an adherence to their method of ruling, removing empowerment and any ability to dictate their native environment. Colonizers successfully pitched groups against each other to ensure divisions, allowing them to divide and rule. And in an urban context, the political decisions of councils and governments dictate who lives where, who loses their homes, who is displaced, and how communities might be broken and segregated. Social forms of colonization took form in various ways. The social hierarchy created by the colonizers around race and class fed into society. As the colonized were consistently rejected and deemed inferior, creating an aspiration to become the colonized as lighter skin color and mimicking the colonized cultures became part of common cultural practice. So I'm sure everyone's seen these images and these beauty products of skin lightening lotions, trying to create your hair in similar ways to a European culture, all ways of kind of making the local, the, the colonized feel inferior. In an urban context, this would mean the cultural activities that once took place may, not, may no longer take place as people have been made to feel inferior and inappropriate 
Bengali weddings in Brick Lane are fewer as the character of the street changes. The nature of the food sold in Spitalfields no longer appeals to the local people, as instead of um, instead of holding fresh fruit and vegetables, it kind currently it contains more fast food or immediately available food that cater for the newly for those who have newly moved to the area and the new demographic, which is obviously very different. Economic colonization occurred in various ways in the colonies, but ultimately, ultimately left them poor and impoverished. Famines in India and extreme poverty that the country continues to recover from as the British extracted resource from the country to fund their own. This graph directly shows the correlation between European colonialism and subsequent wealth with the poverty of both China and India. In an urban context, gentrification and the pricing out of local people from their neighborhoods, both in terms of affordable homes and also the cost of local goods and services, which start to become affordable. So having analyzed the various forms of colonization, the next layer to uncover looks at coloniality. Coloniality refers to long, coloniality refers to long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations and knowledge production well beyond the limits of colonial administration. Coloniality survives colonialism. It is maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self image of peoples, in aspirations of self and so many other aspects of our modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality in all the time and every day. So there are three main elements to coloniality, which are coloniality of power, coloniality of knowledge and coloniality of being. So um, coloni coloniality of power refers principally to the interrelation among modern forms of exploitation and domination. It defines and describes the living legacy of colonialism in contemporary societies in the form of social discrimination that has outlived formal colonialism and integrated in succeeding social orders. It identifies the racial, political and social hierarchical orders imposed by European colonialism, which is the most dominant in our current day. This hierarchy prescribed value to certain peoples and societies while disenfranchising others, resulting in a caste system where citizens are ranked due to their different phenotypic traits and what was presumed to be an inferior culture. This categorization resulted in a persistent categorical and discriminatory discourse that was reflected in the social and economic structure of the colony and that continues to be reflected in the structure of most modern post-colonial societies. Coloniality of power sees a single society or group as superior, progressive and universal. So the consequence of this is we are creating and reaffirming these existing hierarchical colonial structures. Um, we are reinforcing the superiority of those colonizers. We're forced into assimilation into these power structures at the detriment of our own identity. And it also limits our ability to think outside of these structures. This means that the decisions made within these structures are always going to prioritize and favor those in power and basically represent those very few who hold that power and not the majority of our society at all. Um, so next we look at coloniality of knowledge. It's really interesting. So coloniality of knowledge refers to the impact of colonization on the different areas of knowledge production. The Eurocentric system of knowledge assigned production of knowledge to Europeans and prioritized the use of European ways of knowledge production. Europe's model of global power concentrated all forms of the control of subjectivity, culture, and especially knowledge and the production of knowledge under its authority. So as you can see in this table, the production of knowledge continues to be principally in Europe, as this table shows what are deemed the best university in the world. So if you look at it closely, not only does the US and Europe hold the highest number of the best universities, which is strange considering the global population and, and where, where we live, but also Asia has three in the top 50, while Africa and South America's top three are like past 120 and 250 in their global rankings. So the result of this prioritizing knowledge production of the colonialists 
resulted in a simultaneous denial of knowledge production to the conquered people and repression of traditional modes of knowledge production on the basis of the superiority inferiority relationship enforced by this hierarchical structure. So the effect of this is the opinions and ideas of Europeans are seen as superior that the narrative, this narrative, is reinforced by consistent reproduction and reinforcement within the same education systems, but most notably, epistemicide. Epistemicide uh, forms, looks at how forms of knowledge production outside of Europe as European are seen as inferior. It is a systematic destruction of any indigenous knowledge base. So any knowledge which doesn't converge with the perpetrator's knowledge system it doesn't believe in fusion or exchange of knowledge, but completely disregards the other's knowledge. So an example of this might be in African cultures, how a lot of knowledge is passed through dance and song. And such knowledge is deemed inferior by a lot of European culture. So it's not been acknowledged or documented anywhere. So this knowledge is completely lost because it doesn't, it's not a form of knowledge production that it, it is deemed appropriate. Um, so ultimately, this means that anything that is designed or created from a non-European lens is often deemed as inferior, and therefore the built environment will always be created to some extent under a European lens in our current structures. So the final look at coloniality is coloniality of being. So coloniality of being makes primary reference to the lived experience of colonization, where invisibility and dehumanization are the primary expressions. Because when you're being colonized, you're no longer seen as human because that's the defense to colonize you, right? You're, you're not the same as us. And therefore you're invisible to colonizers and those in power. This can result in imposter syndrome, lack of confidence, a feeling of inferiority, feeling uncomfortable entering spaces or conversing with those who are superior or your colonizers and just reluctance to enter a space that you're not familiar with. And ultimately this means the colonized are continually made to feel inadequate by what's around them and their built environment. So this diagram finally um, begins to collate all these layers of colonialism that have been discussed here. Um, and we've looked at different examples of how they could be manifested spatially in urban, in urban space, both in terms of the design of the spaces and how as individuals we feel and, and our response to them um, as a legacy of colonialism. So these, it's hoped that these ideas can start to question how we think about our environment. So uh, now I'm going to take some, some kind of more built examples so we can apply those, these ideas to, to these kind of built examples. Um, so for example here, um, if we take a part of our city and, and ask these kinds of questions of it, we might start to see it differently. So an example might be the Haygate Estate, which originally had 1,200 socially rented homes and the new development, Elephant Park, was to provide 2,700 homes. And of that, 82 were to be socially rented. Now, if, if you're quick at maths, that means that it went from 100% social rent to 3%. So obviously completely changing the de demographic, controlling the kind of people who were living there, et cetera. 80% of the homes were sold to overseas buyers. The prices um, of a studio flat started at over half a million, which meant they were incredibly out of the reach of local residents of the average wage of those in Southwark, which was £35,000 a year. Um, what else have we got? 216 tenants of 1,000 remained in the borough after the regeneration, so completely displacing a high number of people. Um, and 283 of the 406 mature trees were removed to make way for this redevelopment, so completely changing the... Um, the kind of uh, the physical environment as well. Another example might be on the River Thames, where we can we can observe that eighty four percent of the pedestrian crossings are sit in wealthier boroughs of central and west London. The Thames path doesn't extend to the East London boroughs, which limits access to the river, um, and the average price of a home with a river view is fifty seven percent higher than a standard home. So these are just examples of how like one of the main kind of amenities and beautiful parts of London remains inaccessible to a lot of, a lot of people from different boroughs, from poorer boroughs. So these answers begin to reframe, reframe how we view our urban environment. 
And if the act of building is to colonize within itself, how might it conversely attempt to decolonize or at the very least make a positive impact on its context? It's such questions that design teams need to be asking the privileged few with the power to shape our built environment. Further questions that we need to be thinking about can include who are the prospective users? Who will be displaced? What is the positive effect on the existing local, local community? What is the negative effect? Who will benefit from this? Who will not? Who has designed these spaces and who has not? What is the environmental impact at present and what is the future impact? Who does the design visually represent? Who does it not represent? Who can access it? Who cannot? Who will make decisions about this space and who will not? What kind of biodiverse environments are being destroyed and are any being created? So these ideas will be elaborated further um, in the forthcoming alternative catalogue that is um, being created by um, our organisation called Decosm as part of the Matrix exhibition at the Barbican in May. Um, Decosm is a research collective that brings together spatial practitioners to interrogate the process of colonisation. Um, it's led by myself, Umi, baden Pal, and Niba Serra. Uh, our work looks to push the process of decolonization to create truly equitable space cities and space making. Um, so this is a little taster of what we've been looking at. So yeah, thanks everybody for listening. And I, I hope that it's made us all think a little bit more about how we design our spaces and our cities and the kinds of questions that we should be asking when we're doing that. Thank you.